Another console generation has come and gone. What started with a bang in 2006 with the release of the Xbox 360 ended with a whimper just a few months ago. This isn't a list of which games were objectively better over that seven year period between consoles, but rather a highlight of the games we believe will stand the test of time and show us the way forward. They've helped define what everyone will remember about this generation. We're always told we must remember our mistakes so we don't repeat them. Similarly then, we must remember our past accomplishments. Call of Duty 2, November 2005. The heyday of World War II shooters has passed. At its zenith stands Call of Duty 2. Call of Duty 2 was a trailblazer in many ways. The game scuttled us from one set piece to the next, each more impressive, more astounding than the last. We'll never forget the siege on Stalingrad or scaling the cliffs at Point du Hoc. The campaign was one of those rare lightning blasts of creativity that changes an entire generation forever and irrevocably. The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, March 2006. Many games offer freedom, but The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion dedicates itself to the concept. In doing so, it unearths a vastness that few interactive experiences dare approach. Every corner you pass, every hovel you explore, every city you visit, every discovery you make is followed by an addictive rush of wonder. Oblivion celebrates exploration, so much so that players will throw hundreds of hours into the game before even finishing the first story mission. Where it shines, though, is in the quests. Even the smallest of the 204 quests are given the utmost attention. They're detailed, well-written, and fully realized. Company of Heroes, September 2006. Many RTS games settle for gameplay already perfected by classics like Red Alert and more recently, StarCraft II. Company of Heroes and developer Relic Entertainment sidestepped that sinkhole with an entirely new vision of RTS gameplay. Though there is some macro management, Company of Heroes is all about micromanagement. Field positioning is what matters most, but all the planning in the world won't stop the battle from devolving into a hellish and brutal gunfight. There really isn't any other RTS that presents the mayhem of war like Company of Heroes. Others detach us from the battlefield. Company of Heroes does everything it can to drag you to the front lines, making the horrors of war all too real. Bioshock, August 2007. A lot has been said about Bioshock's story. Rapture, Andrew Ryan, the twist ending, they're all great. And there really isn't much that we can say that hasn't already been said. Instead, we'll talk about its gameplay. You are given a set of tools, weapons and plasmids, to take on whatever bad guys come your way. There's always a choice in combat. As you explore the depths of Rapture, you discover new combos, unlock new tonics, and formulate new tactics, and it's all covered with that same sense of awe that you found in the lighthouse, greeted by that massive bust of Andrew Ryan. No gods or kings, only man. Wii Sports, December 2006. Wii Sports might be a controversial entry. Regardless of its downsides, faults, or detractors, Wii Sports showed us the possibilities of motion controls. It took the idea of the Wii and ran with it. The two were so well ingrained that it was hard to imagine one without the other. The game highlighted the pitfalls and successes of motion controls, all the while hinting at a future market ruled by motion control technology. Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, March 2007. Welcome to the zone. Metro 2033 and Fallout 3 lulled gamers into a false sense of security in regards to post-apocalyptic survival simulators. Stalker smashes that expectation into pieces with a sledgehammer. Life in the zone is hard and frightening. Every bit of difficulty adds realism, a defining pillar of the Stalker series that helped it differentiate itself while standing shoulder to shoulder with other similar games. Portal, October 2007. Portal's simple. Orange portal over here, blue portal over there. It becomes more complicated, but the core concept never changes. You never unlock new moves or new weapons. Instead, the puzzles evolve. Environments change, adding in turrets, lasers, and lava. Each puzzle slightly more involved than the last, each followed by a surge of accomplishment as they're solved. Beautiful in design and execution, Portal is one of the top shelf experiences of the generation, a paradigm of puzzle gaming excellence, and a title that shouldn't be missed by anyone. The Witcher 1 and 2, October 2007 and May 2011. 
The first Witcher managed to wrangle seven novels worth of lore, mythos, and world building into one 40-hour adventure. The Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings released with more impressive visuals and smoother gameplay. Both games had standout moments. The role-playing, political intrigue, and monster hunting were all top-notch, but it was series protagonist Geralt of Rivia that made the game truly remarkable. The beautiful world and enthralling adventure were enough to grab our attention, but it was Geralt's subtle characterization, nuances, and complexity that kept us coming back for more. Crisis, November 2007. There's a reason why Can It Run Crisis is still commonplace on some forums. Crisis asked a lot of PC gaming rigs. It's built to run on the computers of the future, they said at launch. That might have been true, but Crisis didn't stand the test of time because of its cutting edge graphics. The suit doesn't make the man, and the graphics don't make the game. Crisis gives you a handful of weapons, superpowers, and objectives spread across a massive island. Without its open map gameplay, Crisis wouldn't have been much more than a tech demo, an interesting footnote in the history of gaming, not the legend that it is today. Mass Effect, November 2007. Not many games hold gamers' attention for their duration, even less hold for entire trilogies. Bioware built an amazing sci-fi universe from the ground up with a sturdy wireframe of inventive characters, alien races, and worlds. Shepard would just be another video game protagonist without the setting they crafted around him, or her. It's the first Mass Effect that does this the best. It's when we first traveled through a mass relay, when we first stepped foot onto the Citadel, and when we first learned of the Reaper threat. A virtual smorgasbord of memorable moments that stuck with us far longer than any ill sentiment of over how the series has ended. Burnout Paradise, January 2008. Burnout Paradise was an explosive brew, a Frankenstein monster of two very different genres, free roam sandbox games like GTA and the arcade racer that Burnout popularized a generation earlier. It worked. It worked very well. Its careful equation encouraged both experimentation and playful bedlam. It was a breath of fresh air for a stagnant genre that's still worth playing today. No More Heroes, January 2008. Suda51 always goes for the jugular with his strangely hypnotic and violent flair. None of his games pull off his style with as much bravado as No More Heroes. Players take control of Travis Touchdown as he faces off against the world's deadliest assassins. And only Suda could turn that mundane concept into this zany and memorable celebration of gore and excess. Grand Theft Auto 4, April 2008. The sprawl of GTA 4's Liberty City was like nothing we'd seen before. You felt so tiny, so insignificant, dwarfed by the metal jungle that is Liberty City. Liberty City set the playing field for an entire generation, a high watermark for every free roam game to aim for. But Grand Theft Auto 4 wasn't without its fair share of detractors. The new friendship mechanics were met with mixed reactions, series familiars quickly noticed missing features. The thematic disconnects between story and gameplay made GTA 4 a poster child for ludonarrative dissonance. A glorified tech demo to some, and a living, breathing world to others. No one can deny Grand Theft Auto 4's place in video game canon. Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots, June 2008. The Metal Gear series has always impressed us with how it manages to evolve. It's largely because of this evolution that Solid is still lugging around 27 years worth of established story and characters. Metal Gear Solid 4 was a natural evolution of Metal Gear Solid 3. It gave us better controls, more replayability, and prettier graphics. It was a technical powerhouse of the times, the first game to clear the PlayStation 3's throat and show the world what the system was capable of. Most importantly, and most impressively, it managed to wrangle the mammoth lore it carried into a tight, albeit sometimes incomprehensible conclusion that satisfied fans and led to one of gaming's all-time greats, Solid Snake, to his final resting place in gaming canon. Geometry Wars Retro Evolved 2, July 2008 we don't always need to play the newest AAA blockbuster to have a fun time, and not every XBLA game needs to challenge established game design in order to be worthwhile. Geometry Wars offers fun, addictive gameplay, and nothing else. It doesn't strive to be a fixture in your life or carry a deep meaning. It's a quick, joyous distraction, a rest stop on your way from one game to the next, and it does that very, very well. Braid 
August 2008. Braid took us and the seventh console generation to places we never expected. The convoluted line between full price and budget games started to blur here. Braid offered fresher gameplay and a more poignant story than most AAA games had. Its puzzles slowly evolve over time, never missing a beat, yet never losing our attention. At first glance, the story is a sometimes illegible mess of motifs and visual cues, but it evolves too, like the gameplay, turning into a deconstruction of old school sensibilities and cliches. Little Big Planet, October 2008. Play, create, share. On the surface, Little Big Planet isn't much more than a platformer, but dive deeper and you'll soon be caught in its undercurrent. Every level in LBP can be made with its packaged level creator. Sometimes elegant, sometimes convoluted, always impressively complex, the tools here can be used to create any number of adventures that can be then uploaded and played by millions. Little Big Planet captured the bizarre essence of our imagination unlike anything before it, or anything since. It's fantastic and peculiar, weird and miraculous, a strange anomaly that somehow demonstrates all the wonder and all the magic our medium of choice has to offer. Valkyria Chronicles, October 2008. In retrospect, Valkyria Chronicles seems obvious. It combined turn-based Fire Emblem-style strategy with fast-paced action on the ground. It challenged the player to exercise two entirely separate gameplay muscles in order to succeed. It's a hidden gem of a game, and nobody should walk out of the seventh console generation without giving it a try. Dead Space, October 2008. Dead Space did nothing new, but it did a lot right. Developer Visceral deftly avoided decades worth of mistakes and brought the horror genre kicking and screaming into the seventh console generation. Few games do isolation as well as Dead Space. Ominous messages scribbled on the walls warn you of unseen evils. Far-off cries echo down empty corridors. The Ishimaru's bowels groan and ache as it idles in space. And you're never quite sure whether the noises are coming from the ship or its horrors. Gears of War 2, November 2008. Gears of War emerged in November 2006. It revolutionized cover-based shooter mechanics and established itself as the premier multiplayer experience on the Xbox 360. But it was, in many ways, a taste. A taste of what Xbox Live could be, a taste of what the Unreal Engine 3 could accomplish on consoles, and a taste of what would go on to become a celebrated franchise. The second emergence came two years later. Gears of War 2 was the game every kid wanted in their bedroom that holiday season. With the addition of Horde Mode, the extended multiplayer suite and addictive co-op, Gears of War 2 became one of the best deals of the generation. Street Fighter 4, February 2009. Balance, balance, balance. Without it, Street Fighter 4 would not have stayed nearly as relevant for as long as it has. Because of Capcom's constant care and its inherently deep gameplay, Street Fighter 4 fought its way to the top of professional fighting game circuits pretty quickly and then flourished. Street Fighter 4 is easy to learn and difficult to master with an absurdly high skill ceiling, a sometimes brutal game that will hold your attention for months on end, ceaselessly reminding you of how much more there is to learn and how much more room there is for improvement. Batman Arkham Asylum, September 2009. Eyes might have rolled when Batman Arkham Asylum was announced. It was just another licensed game by a studio no one's ever heard of. Novice or not, new developer Rocksteady took its time and built the definitive Batman experience. In stealth, stalked by gun-wielding thugs, Batman must hunt from the shadows. But when the thugs are limited to melee weapons, Batman fights with his fists. The game's greatest accomplishment is how it balances these polarizing gameplay styles. In either scenario, you feel like Batman, which is a tremendous feat few other games, or developers for that matter, could ever hope to achieve. Well, here we are. Now we just gotta find the right temple. Uncharted 2, October 2009. Few games have so many jaw-dropping moments crammed into a story as Uncharted 2. Set piece after set piece astounds. And the multiplayer's sense of verticality and its use of pseudo-platforming make it a better addition than it has any right to be. Uncharted 2 wasn't a pioneer, but it never pretended to be. It's a diamond, hardened by years of refinement and time-tested gameplay. 
Demon's Souls, October 2009. Plenty of games are hard. What makes Demon's Souls unique is its use of difficulty as a tool in establishing setting. Bulletaria is a grim and dangerous place. Everything still alive or undead is either extraordinarily hard to kill or extraordinarily good at killing. It's this constant threat that makes exploration so dangerous. But the world is so majestic in how it revels in the morbid and the otherworldly that we can't look away. Curiosity drives us forward, even into the very bowels of Bulletaria itself. We always want to see what's around the next corner, even though it will likely be our end. This messy balance between exploration and danger creates an addictive concoction that we dare players to try. It's an acquired taste, for sure. But once acquired, players will find one of the most superb adventures of the generation, and one of the best designed games in recent memory. Mirror's Edge, November 2008. Scuttling across rooftops, you'll jump from one skyscraping behemoth to the next. Roll out of the fall and you're on your feet again, sprinting towards the next precipice. There isn't anything else quite like Mirror's Edge. It plays more like a racer instead of a platformer or a shooter. You're always looking for a new route or a subtle adjustment that'll shave just a few seconds off your time. And even though that element of Mirror's Edge is competitive by nature, it's never stressful. It's intoxicating, oddly surreal, and completely sublime. Left for Dead 2, November 2009. Few co-op games approach Valve's Left for Dead 2, a smart approximation of the Hollywood-style zombie flick. It's pitch perfect in its execution and a faultless amalgamation of the two mediums. Just like the characters in the movies, you'll be given ample chances to go back and save your lagging friends, risking your own skin in the process, or run for it, leaving them to their fate. Left 4 Dead 2 doesn't change the core game at all. What it does do is add wider level variety, more weapons, and even a bit more strategy due to the addition of powerful melee weapons. Assassin's Creed 2, November 2009. The first Assassin's Creed setting and parkour enraptured players. For a while, anyway. It ultimately failed to evolve, and after gamers realized the game consisted of the same four or five missions over and over again, they were understandably frustrated. To a large degree, Assassin's Creed 2 fixes the first's issues. Missions are varied, new weapons and equipment are unlocked as players progress, and game mechanics evolve as new concepts are introduced. And no one saw that ending coming. But Renaissance Italy is really the star. It never struck us as the locale particularly ripe for a video game makeover, but Assassin's Creed 2 did a great job of showing us how wrong we were. Unlike the gloom of the Third Crusade, Assassin's Creed II celebrates the romanticism and fantasy of the time. After a few hours spent in Venice or Florence, you can't help but celebrate along with it. Dragon Age Origins, November 2009. It had been nine years since Baldur's Gate II when Dragon Age Origins released in 2009. Filled with nostalgia, its old-school feel and direction offered something unique in a genre heavily influenced by console dominance. Few RPGs offered its sense of strategy or finesse. It's the kind of game where players can lose dozens of midnight hours crafting the perfect party or battle plan, and then come back ready for more in the morning. Artyom. <laughs> Wake at last, I see. Metro 2033, March 2010. Your time with Metro 2033 will be depressing, no doubt. Everything around you, from the enemies, the NPCs, and game mechanics, to the little details in the environment, will constantly remind you of how screwed the human race is. You'll hunt for bullets, gas mask filters, med packs, all of which are disparagingly limited. Metro 2033 created a memorable adventure in a crowded genre, a game that shouldn't be overlooked or missed. One that won't necessarily keep you up at night or stuck in multiplayer lobbies, but one that will stick with you long after you've finished playing. Mount and Blade Warband, March 2010. Games have tried to emulate huge sword and shield battles since pixels appeared on screens. The first Mount and Blade took that ambition and built a game around it finally realizing the dreams of so many would-be video game swordsmen. It was a huge success. Its depth and replayability challenged any AAA game. Warband added what we all wanted, a multiplayer mode. Now those nameless swordsmen on the battlefield weren't so nameless. Warband brought a whole new meaning to the word addictive. And thanks to the modding community, 
Warband is still a very relevant game. Red Dead Redemption, May 2010. The term world building gets thrown around a lot, usually without any clear definition. But if you want a clear example of it, look no further than Red Dead Redemption. Before its release, the Wild West setting was largely unexplored territory. That's not true anymore. Everything you'd want in a Wild West adventure is here. Card games, horseshoes, duels, optional stranger missions and random happenings bring life to the barren west. Stranded denizens look for ways back to town. Seemingly friendly NPCs ambush you on your way from one place to the next. It's little moments like these that make the world more than a singular experience. Alan Wake, May 2010. Alan Wake had a tumultuous development. It started as a sandbox game with thriller elements, but Remedy Entertainment realized some time in development that free-roaming mechanics would be detrimental to the story they wanted to tell. They were largely right. This change produced one of the tightest horror games ever made. Alan Wake is a compulsive adventure, each level begging you to play the next, compounding upon one another until you reach the end of the game, which leaves you hurting for more and begging for explanation. Super Mario Galaxy 2, May 2010. When Super Mario Galaxy 2 was announced, just two years after the original's release, it was hard to not be a little disappointed. It was the second Mario game in as many years, and it was the first true sequel since the Super Nintendo. It was hard to imagine a game better than the first Super Mario Galaxy, but Nintendo somehow delivered. Here, level design is king. The bold and meticulous worlds rang in a new standard for 3D platforming. It's more a continuation than a redesign. It doesn't recreate a new subgenre or bring in any new great innovation, but Super Mario Galaxy 2's platforming is so perfect that it's hard to imagine any decent competition. Super Meat Boy, October 2010. Super Meat Boy is so frustratingly hard, it's sadistic. It requires near perfect levels of twitch reflexes and patience, but it works. It's demanding, but always fair. Each level takes seconds to complete, but requires so much precision that even the easiest will entail a few retries. Die? You immediately respawn and can try again, never having to wait longer than a heartbeat. Without this constant stream of dying and retrying, Super Meat Boy would collapse under its difficulty. With it, Super Meat Boy is one of the most addictive platformers released this console generation. Fallout New Vegas, October 2010. We all know war never changes, but Fallout sure has. Fallout 3 finally released in 2008 as a much different game than series vets might have expected years prior. Fallout wasn't a tactical RPG anymore. It was a first-person shooter with heavy reliance on RPG mechanics. The game's writing, while impressive by itself, missed the satire and comedic wit so integral to the first game's successes, but it was still a great experience. For our money, New Vegas was better. New Vegas was a return to series staples. Stats mattered more. Dark satire returned. And story choices actually made a difference. It was filled with memorable characters, memorable moments, and memorable enemies that kept us coming back, searching every rock, every mesa, every corner of the map, desperate to unearth something we hadn't seen before. The shadow hunting me. I must hurry. My name is Daniel. Amnesia The Dark Descent, February 2011. The scariest thing is what we can't see, what waits for us in the darkness, just out of our reach. Amnesia believes our imagination can conjure greater horror than it could ever show us. And it's right. In a stroke of Lovecraftian genius, developer Frictional Games designed a harsh sanity mechanic. One glimpse of the game's fiends and it decreases your sanity. Lose all your sanity and you'll be completely exposed to the monstrosities. The game teaches you to avoid looking at its own enemies, so that you're forced to imagine what they look like instead. And what we imagine is truly terrifying. Total War Shogun 2, March 2011. The Total War series has been around for a while, and Creative Assembly's precise mix of turn-based building and RTS battles entices us every time. Keep saying, one more turn, or one more battle at bedtime, and you'll soon be greeted by the rising sun. Shogun 2 celebrates series tradition, rather than reforming. What results is an exact distillation of the franchise, and the most balanced, least buggy of the bunch. 
Production values are sky high too. The Japanese Nanga style of menus and portraits pays dividends in connecting the player to the aesthetic feel of the late Tokugawa period in Japan. Infamous 2, June 2011. Infamous 2 is not just another sandbox game. Unlike Grand Theft Auto or Skyrim, the focus here is on the player character, a superhero. As you progress, more abilities are unlocked, you're given more tools, more ways to traverse, and more toys to fool around with. The game opens up beautifully. Spider-Man 2 established the free roam superhero genre during the PlayStation 2 era. Infamous 2 is an evolution of that, exploiting the recipe in almost every way. Minecraft, November 2011. Whether you just want to let your imagination run wild and build, or explore a procedurally generated 3D world, Minecraft has you covered. Planted perfectly at the intersection between your imagination and adventure, Minecraft has captured the hearts and minds of millions. A cultural juggernaut, the game will give you an absurd amount of freedom along with the countless mods and texture packs created by the community, which is more than enough to keep the game interesting even now, years after its release. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, November 2011. Twilight Princess gave us a taste of a motion-controlled Link. Some liked it, others didn't. Skyward Sword took what Nintendo promised with Twilight Princess, and to some extent the entire Wii console, and finally delivered. You move the Wii remote to the left, Link moves his sword to the left. When it worked, it was a revelation. When it didn't, it was... frustrating. But still, before Skyward Sword's release, one-to-one -one sword fighting existed only in our dreams. Zelda finally made it a reality. Journey, March 2012. Minimalism is a defining style in all arts. Instead of relying on story or on traditional cues, minimalist pieces prefer context to definite meaning urging players to come up with their own conclusions. In the process, they strip away what many other titles would consider essential. Journey's story is an open book, entirely explorable, a virtual sandbox of hinted half-truths and evasive innuendo. Its simple gameplay complements its stark design at every corner, urging you to plunge deeper into its barren and beautiful world. Borderlands 2, September 2012. Borderlands was an easy sell, the gameplay of modern shooters with the gear-based treadmill from Diablo and Torchlight. Instead of a new sword, you'll find a new gun. Instead of some new pants, you'll find a new class mod. Simply put, it took the best of both worlds and created a wholly unique and wholly addictive experience. Borderlands 2 improved upon the first in nearly every way. Better graphics, more gun variation, larger worlds. New skills and classes made characters feel more distinct than before. An actual story, with some clever writing and great humor, helped give the world an identity that wasn't there before. The Walking Dead, November 2012. The Walking Dead showed us two things. How episodic games could work in a very, very big way, and how to make choices matter to the player even if they don't matter to the story. The pitch was simple. Make a decision in episode one, then see the ramification of that decision play out in the remaining four episodes. By the penultimate episode, most players will find themselves in a similar position regardless of what choices they made. What The Walking Dead does so great is that it orchestrates meaning for each of these choices. The writing is so clever and the choice is so seemingly poignant that you'll have a hard time not falling in love with your fellow survivors. At the center of it all is 11-year-old Clementine. You can't help but consider the possibility that the way you act around her will affect the way she sees the world. And it's that connection that makes this game so very worth experiencing. The Last of Us, June 2013. The Last of Us has a lot going on for it. Gameplay is top-notch, and the script is nothing short of amazing, but its world is what captivated us the most. Not many post-apocalyptic dystopias inspire the same awe as The Last of Us. Here, nature struggles to reclaim the world from humanity's fading hubris, the remains of which are still present, desolate and bleak. Bleak in the way their emptiness highlights how these places used to be something to someone. This was a child's bedroom. This, a school. An office building. Few games capture the foreboding as well as The Last of Us. Fewer still manage to balance it so perfectly with a sense of spastic hope. 
What results is a game we wouldn't dare call fun in the most traditional sense, but a game we wouldn't hesitate to call one of the most absorbing pieces of fiction to come out of the medium. <laughs> you feel that breeze, huh? I tell you, on a day like this, I just sit on my porch, pick away my sex tray. So there you have it. As the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Wii U, and our new video cards heat up, and as the years pass by, we hope that these games will remain close in our memories. If they don't, if some of them are forgotten, then we hope that this video will serve as a marker of their existence. If one person goes back and checks out any of these games after watching this video, then we'd consider it a success. For now, look onward towards the future. Something tells us that the best is yet to come.